Hello, this is Zeke O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, here to talk about the past month, October, in review for paleontology. Firstly, there was a new species of Tyrannosaur found, named Dynamo Terror Dynasties, meaning Powerful Terror Ruler, because apparently the authors just wanted to one-up the name of Tyrannosaurus Rex, meaning Tyrant Lizard King. The species is entirely new to science, and comes from New Mexico in rocks that are about 80 million years old. This makes it about contemporaneous with species like Lythernax or Teratophonius from Utah, which both lived at about the same time period, 75 to 80 million years ago. This helps to show how species can diversify very rapidly and in a relatively short amount of time, as the environments that these species were all in were all very similar coastal wetlands. And yet we still got three different species there because of those slight variations that allowed for them to diversify so greatly. Pinnipeds are found worldwide as seals, sea lions, and, depending on how far north you go, walruses. Walrus are unique in being the only members of this group to have developed long tusks for fighting within the species. However, they didn't always have these tusks. A new species named Titanoteria orangensis is from California and from the same family as the walrus. And though Titanoteria is extinct, its extinction can help us understand just what made the tusked walruses more successful and able to live into our own time period, and exactly what it is that may help cause their extinction, particularly in the face of climate change. Piranha mesodon was a very piranha-like fish, coming from the same deposits as Archaeopteryx from 160 million years ago in Germany. However, it's not directly related to the piranhas. The convergent evolution we see between Piranha Mesodon and the modern day piranha is actually astounding. They were both relatively round bodied fish, being very much a circle, and then having their large pointing flesh eating teeth at the front of their mouths, designed for cutting and ripping pieces of meat off of larger prey items. But additionally, in their evolution, we see a lot of parallels, mainly that their ancestors, and piranhas like the modern day Paku fish, which use very much bulbous teeth to do a lot of crushing, and in the Paku's case, for things like seeds and nuts that fall off of trees. And this is the same kind of adaptation in teeth we see in the ancestors to Piranha Mesodon, meaning that this kind of convergent evolution is actually a fairly successful version of the fish body plan, and we could potentially see it rise up in other places. For example, with the Paku, which has been introduced to New Guinea, and has acted much more aggressively there than it has in its native Amazon basin areas. What has been considered one of the longest dinosaurs of all time may not have actually been nearly as long as we expected it to be. And there's quite a few reasons to this. Amphicelius fragimilis has been widely considered to be this longest dinosaur of all time. However, it was very partially found, with only a few bones from the hip and a single vertebra being discovered. And also since then, those bones have crumbled to dust and can no longer be completely accurately studied. Instead, we have to rely on things like illustrations and photos from the time period they were found, which is before the year 1900. By studying the photos and the illustrations of these fossils, some scientists have come to the conclusion that Amphilocelius wasn't a species of that genus, but rather that it would be closer to a Rabacosaurid. And this is really unique, as A, Amphilocelius has widely been considered that longest species, and Rebeccasaurids don't hold the same body plan, significantly shortening the neck and the tail in order to have a much more compact body size, meaning that the idea that Amphicelius could have been 100 feet long is very unlikely, and that it was much more likely closer to 50 feet, which is a much more manageable size, to be fair. Additionally, there has been evidence that the Rubacosaurs were present in the same formation from which Amphilocelius was found, with some footprints not fitting any of the other sauropods that we already know of from the region, such as the Diplodocoids or the Brachiosaurs. With this, Amphilocelius fragimilis has been given a new genus, Maracunosaurus fragimilis, this under the Rubacosaurids. And again, with the only evidence we have for this being photos and illustrations of very broken down fossils, it's hard to say for sure if it was indeed a Rubacosaur. But it is the best guess that we have right now, 
based on all of the available evidence. Vertebrate life was very limited in the early development of complex life on Earth. Large arthropods such as Anomalocaris or some of the larger Eurypterids dominated the food chains of the time period. However, a lot of these arthropods also developed further away from shore in more reef-like environments. This allowed vertebrates to have a niche in the near shore environments, occasionally even going into fresh water before other species had been able to. Being specialized for this niche in near shore environments may have helped the vertebrates to survive and come out on top at the Ordovician and Silurian extinctions, during which time the sea level dropped over 140 meters. This is because lowering the sea level had a significant impact on the reefs of the time period. But near shore environments like those found near river mouths would always have existed even with the sea level dropping. Giving invertebrates an environment in which to survive and then radiate outwards from after the extinction. When thinking of dinosaurs, we traditionally have the carnivorous theropods and then the herbivorous sauropods and ornithischians. But that changed with the discovery of things like Therizinosaurus, which was a plant-eating theropod. And while that's very unique, we haven't really found the opposite behavior in either of the other branches. Up until this last month at least, when scientists at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology's annual meeting showed a new skull of Pachycephalosaurus, which showed meat-eating teeth. Now, these sharper teeth aren't just like tusks on some species of the deer or even elephants. These are specifically serrated teeth, which would have been used for catching and eating meat. And while it's not likely that Pachycephalosaurus would have been running around hunting hadrosaurs, it is very likely that it would have been eating some of the smaller animals from the area, such as small mammals or lizards. Additionally, this is a juvenile skull, so there is the potential for an ontogenetic change, where it wouldn't have the same teeth after a certain time period in its development. And as it got older, it may have pivoted more fully towards herbivory. As it was just the announcement of the find, rather than a proper research paper written on it, there is still the potential for these questions to be asked in the few months leading up to the release of the paper on the specimen. And finally, at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology Conference, there was another panelist which talked about the development of pterosaurs in the egg. And this is an important discussion because it can help us look at modern day bird species which occupy many of the same niches that these pterosaurs once did and what caused the birds to become successful and for the pterosaurs to die out at the end of the Cretaceous. Notably, it seems like while well, most birds need to be raised in a nest up until the point that they're ready to fly, pterosaurs seem to have hatched basically ready with all the bones and musculature needed in order to fly. And this comes from the most recent finds of pterosaur eggs from both Argentina and China. With this much development taking place inside the egg, it makes it much more likely that the pterosaurs needed to incubate for a significantly longer amount of time than the modern day birds do. In modern day birds, the longest period it takes for an egg to hatch is in the emperor penguin, which takes two months. With the muscular developments in the pterosaurs eggs, it's likely that they needed at least six months to incubate before hatching, which could have led to their extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, as those kind of longer hatching periods would slow down turnover rates for new generations. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting happened last month. The next one will be in October of 2019 in Brisbane, Australia. So if you're in that area, you know, feel free to go. Other than that, take care. Be safe, don't go extinct.